Well, I'm going to, I'm going to use a little countdown thing. And I think you, did, I think you already did. It looks like we're live on my. Screen. I know, but I'm going to run it. Will it run a minute? In oh. that way, because it's now <laughs> telling people to come in. Uh everyone it is time to ruin dinner and uh i'm excited we're gonna have some fun and and diana was so inspired uh that she's coming <laughs> out of the sick the hole of sickness to to have some fun with my gatorade my tissues and my indictment I'm not sure if everybody in your community, you know, we have a lot of crossover, but we have people who are in separate too. Um, not everybody in your community knows that I was diagnosed with COVID eight days ago. So it's been, uh, it's been pretty tough, but here I am. And that's really nice. Thank you for saying I look good, Carlton, because I feel like death warmed over. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I'm just, uh, you're not testing positive and just imagine in the next few days, you'll, you'll realize how much you missed, uh, a fully functioning brain. At least that oh. was my experience. <laughs> I was supposed to be grading when I had COVID oh, and, dear. <laughs> and I was reading papers by the end of it. I'm like, wait, what was the thesis? Oh, this God. isn't good. Uh, Especially in your field, process theology and science and religion. I, at that point, it would just be like, A, <laughs> A, <laughs> A. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. See, I feel, <laughs> I feel like they appreciate my critical commentary on their work. And uh, though I'm, some probably would have preferred yeah. uh, a poorly examined but generously graded uh, exam. But um, <clears throat> now... Uh, why don't I? Why don't you set the stage? I listened to the I listened to the indictment read, and I texted you. I was like, I don't know. This is pretty rough. <laughs> if any, if this is like things that are going to come out while you're in a uh, in a in a in a trial, doesn't seem. I'm not optimistic for the orange menace, but um, you know, orange. Oh, uh, yeah. well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is to go with our Cheetos that we had last night in celebration. So, um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know what to think. It's funny because, you know, so many of my friends, you, I, and you weren't one of them last night, but I got this like string of texts going, hallelujah, and all this sort of stuff. And it's just like, oh, damn, one more indictment here. And one more thing for him to wiggle out of, or one more thing for him to stretch into the election so that he can get reelected and then free himself, you know, to be king for life or whatever he wants to do. So there's a level here, and I didn't put this in my email to my people, but there's a level here that I feel like we're in this sort of gerbil wheel of enthusiasm. Oh, we got him this time. We got him this time. And then he's like a really big fish, you know, who just keeps getting away from you. So, so I've got those, that set of feelings, but then, you know, I read it today, which is interesting. Um, and 
it's it's a lot worse, I think, than even I expected. And that's saying a lot. Because <laughs> you know me, I, I expect nothing of Trump. I expect nothing but lies and cover up and rape and everything else, you know? And, and so... So he gets no passes from me, but this is really, this is really pretty bad. And um, I think the, the thing that surprised me most about it was they've like got him. Mm. I mean, you read it too, but it's, it, and I'm really interested in what your response is. And when you read the indictment, it's like every other page or every page, every other paragraph, it says, and this is what Trump said. And this was a lie. And these people all told him the truth of the situation and he still refused to, you know, and he still lied, even while recognizing to certain people that he understood the truth. Like there's this one part Mm -hmm. uh, where he's talking to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and it's apparently right about the time he wanted to bomb Iran. And uh, I mean, I looked at the date and I thought, isn't that when? Oh, yeah. He told me about it when I was at Mar-a-Lago. He waved the papers around. He was like, Trip, just check this out. (laughs) Bob Moran, you know. Yeah, that's in the that's in the other indictment. And so so he literally says to the Joint Chiefs of Staff when they say, well, it's only 17 more days until there's a new president. And Trump literally says, yeah, let's just pass that on to the next guy. And so that means that he was at least clear enough in his own mind to understand <coughs> that he wouldn't be president after January 20th. And yet he just kept persisting. And so I think to me, that's in effect one of the more shocking parts is that there's just everything he said was a lie. Yeah, the uh, the thing I would, the thing I was rather... Well, it surprised me hearing it all kind of uh, laid out in, you know, uh, court ease, where it's just like, here are the facts. Here are what we know. Here's what this charge equals. Here's why we are comfortable making it. It is that uh, I think that the way all of the information was kind of slowly released, you know, be it in the committee and then plays out in news things, you, you don't really just see it all lined up. In a in about as you know, I don't know, like objectively going like here's the charges, here's what this means, here's why we did this, uh sitting there. And um I just I don't know. I, I listen to it, you know, and, and because of summer with three kids and things, I don't I don't follow, I don't like know what's going on in the news is moment to moment, <laughs> and which might be good, but I I was like, oh, man, what a great opportunity for all the other GOP presidential candidates just to be like, do we really want to do this? Uh, Even ones that, you know, that at some point uh, had been critical are now out defending it, be it, you know, uh, that uh, the head of the House. I mean, basically, um, DeSantis, uh, like you read these responses and you go, I don't. It's in your own self-interest for him to go away. Like, do you think it is so shut that you can just appease his, you know, hardcore voters or, or what? Because like the only one that was kind of like rather direct, at least in the responses I saw was, uh, former vice president Pence, who was just, who, who gets gets name checked. He clearly (laughs) testified here. Yeah, I mean, you can hear Mike Pence, like telling the truth throughout this whole thing and and trump complained about him in it for telling the truth he's like it he asked him didn't he like something like oh he waited to leave the room he goes oh he tells the truth too much he feels like he has to tell the truth (laughs) he literally said to him you're too honest yeah you're too honest (laughs) it's like that should if i was mike pence i'd put that on my tombstone you know when i died uh you're too honest mike (laughs) 1958 to whenever you know, and, and so, I mean, those are the kinds of things that I, that, you know, I started referring to with the lying mm-hmm. you know, it, and it's like people I don't like very much. I mean, you can, you can go through and smartly pick out if you followed the whole thing, 
um, especially the last summer with the Congre congressional thing, um, you can pick out different folks, all of whom are Republicans. Every person I think who is quoted in this indictment is a Republican. I don't think there was one non-Republican in this whole thing. And you, and you just see these people constantly coming to him and saying, you know, sir, you lost. Sir, that's a lie. Sir, the vice president can't do this. You know, all the, all the sir stuff. <coughs> but he just, you know, you're too honest, Mike. It's just, it's the idea that one man by the sheer force of will can bend the arc of everyone else's view of reality. And those those slimy, spineless GOP candidates just are proving the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're loathsome. I mean, I, I tweeted out that today. The G GOP is loathsome. Um, the only person who I have any admiration for, okay, so Mike Pence told the truth. Good for him. He learned that in Sunday school, and he should tell the truth because he did the right thing in this case. Yeah, he also told us that if he gets elected, he just wants to outlaw abortion. So that's always good. Unlike well, uh, at least unlike some front. of the other uh, some of the others that were like no no we're originalists why would we this is settled law <laughs> right at least he tells he really seems to tell the truth um, and then uh, Will Hurd I mean see that's the thing when, to get to your question uh, since I was in bed watching television and you've been watching kids um, there was that GOP thing in mm -hmm. Iowa. I have no idea when it was, probably about six days ago. And they all got up and gave their little 10 minute speeches. And Wolf Hurt got up and, and just demolished Trump, said he was a liar, said, uh, you know, he wasn't worthy of the presidency, all this sort of thing. And the whole crowd just like turned on him and booed him mercilessly. And, um, you know, I'm sure he didn't pick up a single vote. <laughs> <laughs> Iowa. And that's what those other guys are afraid of. Yeah. You know, they're just afraid of the power of the crowd, which is, and it's the power of the crowd that Trump <clears throat> seems to still be able to control at some level to bend the arc of reality. I mean, that's what he's depending on. Do you, do you, does this feel, okay, I'm wondering if this feels different to you because here's what, um, now, you know, granted, I've just been back in the States for a year and I'm in the South and I've had uh, quite a few sobering conversations with uh, uh, individuals that are uh, very far from being aligned with me politically. Uh, but the the I don't hear when talking to friends uh, or neighbors and things uh like they have any genuine worry of what happens if the whole system is just trashed. You know, it like I, I keep going like you do like you you know, like even even as all the people that work for him are like, Yeah, he's not good for democracy, that he's a liar, like blah blah blah. Like at what point like does any kind of um any kind of desire to preserve a means of relating across all the difference that's contained in the United States uh, without resorting to, to kind of violent tribal engagement or sheer perverse manipulation of the system. I, I don't, I worry about that. And, you know, that might inspire me to vote for Joe Biden instead of Cornell West. But the, like, I just sit there and go, do but do you really want what happens if we do this? Yeah, they do. Don't I don't know if they really I'm like sitting there going, I don't think you've hung out with with people that disagree with you very much. This is well, it's a ghost in my head. I'm like, you just need some new friends. Like <laughs> they're not that bad as like humans. Then we have these different commitments and they get rallied up at the macro. Then we start doing stupid stuff. And uh um and and when you know all these people are lying to you, because off the record, they all know Trump's a fool and a charlatan. Like we mm -hmm. all have seen uh, and heard tapes that even the people you're listening to that are selling you stuff like the Fox News people and all these kind of things, they all know he's a fraud. Like, like, couldn't you, like, what makes you, what animates you? The only answer I got from anyone was, uh, oh, it's just a, like what Trump is just a lot more fun. Yeah. 
that's it's, been that's been in several surveys recently is that they don't want to vote for DeSantis, who is, I think in certain ways, DeSantis has even got worse policies than Trump. I mean, he's been very effective in Florida carrying out horrendous political mm -hmm. outcomes. Um, but he is so you would think they'd like that. <laughs> But they, but they, he's no fun. I don't know if you saw the thing about DeSantis in New Hampshire, where they offered tickets for ha come have a beer with DeSantis, and they were selling tickets for fifty dollars, and hardly anybody signed up. And so then they did this cut rate special: come have beer with DeSantis for a buck. And so you twenty, got a, you got a beer for a dollar. You got a beer for a dollar, and twenty nine people came. <laughs> I mean, do you think like so much of that energy Maybe is just... Maybe you get more Theology Beer Camp. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I just want everyone to know, theologybeer.camp. You, too, can come have uh, all the beer you can drink. Uh, also, this year, uh, we, have, we have winery coming and a kombucha uh, brewery. Um, so, yeah, you can come. It'd so, be, anyway. <laughs> it's more than a dollar, but the company is a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> The, and unless Cornell West shows up, nobody's running for president. I know, <laughs> but he's he's more than welcome. He's more than welcome. Uh, the the you, you know I think, and I don't know what to do with this, but um, one of the homebrewed community members messaged me, and she's a Episcopal priest, but in a rural part of Tennessee, and she said that, um, she said that it's she doesn't know how to talk towards the kind of enjoyment people get out of their tribal identity, both like in, in the ugly sides of the left and right. But I mean, I think the, the support for Trump is really easy to see if it's not your team that you're like, well, you all kind of know who he is, but you're more excited about him. You don't, you don't even have to really agree with him. Um, like I saw that recent poll uh, where it's like if you think X or you think Y, um, they Trump wins both sides for for like oh a more aggressive foreign policy, more restrictionist, bigger right. tax, less tax, all these things. Doesn't it doesn't matter. matter. They just vote for him. Right. And and um and the thing she said is like is there a way to not come across partisan and framing? Um, we like as Christians, a different kind of character needs to be. Uh, pursued and uh, in thinking about public discourse, part of being a different kind of character, Christians should have a certain kind of character engaging as citizens. And, uh, and it's just hard if everyone knows where you're located to talk about that without it seeming um, without it seeming partisan. But I, I was like, I don't know. I'll make Diana answer your question. <laughs> yeah. There's a level of, um, throwing my hands up in the air like I just did, uh, that I have with these questions at this point. Um, I have found that in the last, I think, 14 to 16 months, since I've been speaking engagements more, almost all of my speaking engagements come from red place, blue churches and red places. And so that means that the vast majority of the stories that I have been hearing are coming from communities where they literally feel cut off from the people around them. And so it's in, it's been intriguing to see how brave these little churches often are. And sometimes they're even bigger churches um, because they don't back down. Um, they're mm -hmm. involved, they're involved in their local pride festivals. They still have black lives matter signs that hang up. They're involved in different kinds of uh, ac actions politically to ensure voting rights and they're doing all kinds of great stuff, but they're losing their friends. <coughs> Excuse me. They're losing their friends. And I have asked them, you know, what have you done about it? And most people are just saying, you know, I've had to let go. Um, I just was in a conversation a couple weeks ago with a woman who didn't go to her 50th high school reunion in this little town where she's lived almost all her life. And it was because she said, I go and I have to sit around and listen to everybody that I've known for, oh, for more than, you know, oh, three quarters of my life. And they tell me that 
they talk about people like me as if I'm stupid and wrong. And she said, I just don't go anymore. And so, so, so that's got me kind of like a little depressed about this. So, so there's that, there's the reality of it all. And then I keep trying to think about, are there some theories that we might be able to pull out? And one of them is, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, there's nothing wrong with belonging to a tribe. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that when uh, progressive types start saying bad stuff about tribes, you know, oh, they're just part of that tribe or they're just, this is just tribalism. Um, I think that we really have to watch that because we're the ones who are supposed to be sensitive about indigenous peoples. And mm -hmm. the language of tribe reminds us of something incredibly important. And that is everyone needs a place to belong and everyone needs to feel like they if in effect are part of a tribe and we have tribes in the Bible, we have tribes in indigenous cultures. Um, there's nothing wrong with tribes and there's nothing wrong with tribal identity. Indeed, that can be a very clarifying thing. The problem is, is that when tribes think they're superior to every other tribe mm -hmm. or they isolate themselves from all the other tribes. So the problem is not that we belong to tribes or not that we find meaning in in tribal belonging but the question is how do the tribes function together and mm -hmm. not just de not destroy one another and so you know if the episcopal your episcopal priest friend wants to cogitate on something i think that that might be worth cogitating on you know what is it in the tribal identity of the people that she serves that is worth holding up and praising um, and then, you know, sort of asking that next question as to, should our tribe, should this tribe, should your tribe get along with other tribes or are you just trying to wipe out all the tribes? And, and so to say, you know, is it's tribal warfare is the problem, mm -hmm. not, not tribes. So I think maybe, you know, there might be a little sort of thread of, of, um, the theological wisdom to pull on there uh, that might begin to open up some of these questions in congregations uh, in a new way. But like I say, that's, that's, that's theory at this point. It's just something I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think there's a, um, yeah, I mean, in, in tri being part of a tribe is actually important for just human flourishing. That's right. right. But I think you're right. It's, it's, it's like, but, but is your self understanding as a tribe, uh, one that to be this is to, uh, be antagonistically, um, you know, engaged to another. And, you know, part of what, part of the situation, I think, as a, as a nation is, uh, the way in which a growing percentage of the population don't feel that the very mechanisms of the democracy are the means by which uh, the will of the people gets done Correct. and the process of uh, legislating and voting and these kinds of things are viable mechanisms. Uh, when you get uh, kind of the, the growing income inequality, and then you get uh, the growing power of big money and multinational companies on on our politicians and, uh, uh, and, and these kinds of things it's, and, um, that like, uh, both Trump and Biden don't, are, don't feel like debating. Uh, you see, uh, the, the democratic parties reorganizing the state's orders, uh, to privilege states that voted for Biden. Um, they, there are plenty of reasons on both, uh, to look at both parties as, uh, as wanting to win the next election at all cost and not wanting to listen to the constituents and such. And then, then you just blame people with frustrations uh, for, Oh, now you, you just think of like the never Trumpers there. They, all the white working class types, uh, mainly people without college degrees that are like super hardcore for Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they still are, aren't taking the lectures from the rich Republicans and 
Uh, and and you see that uh, the 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 growing dis uh, the disinterest like Biden, Biden got great response from millennials and younger. And those are the groups that have soured on him the most. Uh, and you can just go through a list of things he said he would do that he's the only person that he needs no one's help to do that he hasn't done. Um, and then you wonder what's happening. Like he <coughs> sent, me an, sent me an email asking for money again. And I wrote him a little letter and was like, well, uh, considering I'm about to start spending $600 a month on uh, student loan repayments, you're not getting money. And here's a list of the other people I've given money to that won't be getting money. And um, also, uh, here's here's some links to explain your your constitutional authority as president to do what you said you would do, but I don't really think you ever believed it anyway. And and like so, like when you're sitting there in these situations, and then uh, it is so easy, I think, for people that are more progressive to look and see how this is screwing up on the other side, but then we don't think about how it functions on ours. But both parties have this thing where it's like the knife's edge is so much there, and and each side sees the other one as such a threat, they'll just line up and. And and uh, and and it because we're more scared of Trump, right? Uh, than uh, on on one side, and others are so scared of Biden and his. I wish it was more socialist agenda. Uh, and, and then you get to a place where majority of the country doesn't really believe in the democratic process at all. Uh, and and well, you know, what happens? It's it. I think the anxiety level goes up. You know. Yeah. Right. The anxiety level does go up. But one of the things I think is really interesting about everything you just said is, um, you know, I vote for Democrats. I worked on the Biden campaign and, and I probably will again. Um, but I haven't made any commitments one way or the other. Um, but there is a, there is a difference. And what, what has happened is when Ronald Reagan in 1979, 1980, 1981, whenever it was, made the joke about how, you know, there's no, no, nothing more. F the, the guy from the government shows up and says, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. And then Reagan says, uh, you know, those are the worst la words in the English language. Um, that has become the narrative arc of American cult political culture over the last 40 years since mm -hmm those words were uttered and there, there there are huge problems related to corporations and the ways in which corporations control politicians on both sides of the the aisle and i was just reading this story about the orlando magic which has a huge pride festival and um gave four hundred thousand dollars to victims of the pulse nightclub and all this kind of stuff well, it turns out they're owned by Betsy DeVos and they just gave $50,000 to DeSantis's campaign. And see, that's the way corporations behave. It's actually the way religious denominations behave too. Any institution behaves this way. And mm -hmm. that is it wants to protect itself. And so it plays both sides of pretty much every fence that it can figure out how to play in order to protect itself and further its own interests. This is what corporations do. Now, how responsive a political system is to that becomes, I mean, that's a huge question. And it's one that the Supreme Court gave, took away some of our tools to deal with, you mm -hmm. know, way back there. So just to, like I said, just to kind of go a little bit more deeper with what you were saying is I was just with Bill McKibben this last week, mm -hmm. um, you know, or two weeks ago, whenever it was in Wild Goose. And uh, the question about Biden and environmental policy came up and person in the audience uh, who was probably in their 60s was really angry and got up and said, you know, Biden's blown it. You know, who should we vote for instead? And Bill McKibben, who has every reason in the world to want a different pr candidate for president, said, it's not that simple. And then he said, Biden has done X, Y, Z. And this has been very good. And these have been the disappointments. And the truth is, we, we praise him and we keep pressing towards more of X, Y, Z and what we want. And we keep reminding him mm -hmm. of the ways in which he disappoints. And see, that's what you can do with those Democrats. That's what you can do in that email to Joe Biden's campaign or whatever. But that is what we lose on the other side of the ledger. So these are not equal, equal mm -hmm. things, um, even though 
what both of them have done in different ways has pressed Americans towards the narrative that Ronald Reagan wants you still trip to believe. Ronald Reagan wants you to believe, period, full stop, end, that the government that we have has failed and can never fix anything. And so that is what worries me, is seeing smart people continue to give in to a narrative that was invented Mm -hmm. specifically by one side to discredit the entire system and to see that 40 years later that discrediting was such a powerful narrative that it's functionally worked. And so that's one of the things that I personally want to resist. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we can be a lot smarter about how we both criticize the, 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 those shortfalls and which is exactly what Bill said. Bill said, Mm -hmm. you know, to be able to leverage the powers that we do have, even with this, I mean, Bill spent, what is it now? 40 years fighting Exxon. You know, Mm -hmm. you're, you're worried about student loans. You know, he's worried about the big, the biggest corporation in the world, pouring endless amounts billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of oil down our throats so that the whole mm-hmm. plant the whole planet dies and so so if if somebody like bill mckibben can sort of stand back and have that kind of measured view of things i think that's a model of how one participates in democracy and you know, I, I just that's just kind of where I want to go with that, you know, and and, um, you, it, and for people that don't know, Bill McKibben has been a long time uh, environmentalist, but also a deep person of faith. And you can uh, his nonprofit 350.org, which conveniently is also the web URL, is a great place uh, to connect for that. And, it, and if that's an issue and you're thinking about it in your congregation, about how to engage as a congregation, Interfaith Power and Light has lots of resources around um, uh, that to help people in different denominations and faith traditions figure out how to model eco activism, but also be informed. They have regional groups right. on local because you can make more impact on local policies as well. And that's um, to me, that's sort of what what it's all about. In a democracy, we have this awful thing where we have to make this binary choice nobody likes binaries we're post-binary sort of thinkers whatever um but we have to do that and then there's this other level of the of relational hand-to-hand sort of activism uh to pressure a system to do different things and one day all of that hand-to-hand activism i think will result in a shift in the binary choice politics, but we don't, we just don't have that right now. And, and so I, I get, I get pretty upset because I was just looking at polling data, excuse me. And the idea that, um, that Biden could lose by, you know, Robert Kennedy or whatever, some candidate peeling off. I, I've seen enough of that in my lifetime. You know, I mean, I, honest to God, none of this would have happened if Ralph Nader wouldn't have stepped out, would have stepped out of the race in 2000 and not taken 4% of the vote away from Al Gore in key states. And, and then we got Hillary Clinton in 2016. It's like, have we learned nothing um, about this kind of thing? And had we had Al Gore, the whole trajectory of the last 20 years would be entirely different. And even with Hillary Clinton, we wouldn't be sitting here today facing this, um, you know, this pile of crap of a criminal, of a criminal former president who has, I mean, this, this little page, this stuff here, this amounts to treason. You know, Jack Smith doesn't say it, but plenty of other people are just saying, okay, he, he describes everything in here yeah. without ever using the word treason is that, the, that this man is a traitor to the United States of America and to American democracy. But it'd be, it'd be hard given his job to say that right before, a, uh, before the actual court proceedings and things. Right, right. But so, so anyway, I just want, well, I just, I, just here, I get it with, I get it with Biden, you know, I, I well, wish. What about, what about. It, but it's not, it's not to be, I think. Yeah, I, I just wonder, see, 
I think it's much easier to push Biden, who, like a lot of times, at least career wise, he just goes to wherever the center of the Democratic Party is um, and has changed his mind on things in positive ways plenty of time. Um, actually putting someone that's labor friendly in charge of the labor board has been a huge thing for growth in labor. I mean, like I have a list of things Biden's done that I tell my leftist friends that are in swing states, but I'm like, if it's a solid state, yeah, go vote for Cornell, but, uh, um, (laughs) whoever you want in California, but the, uh, but I see, like, I think it would be easier to push him. Uh, if you, if you actually had like actual debates, it just looks like he's hiding. Like, uh, it, and and are you telling me you don't think he'll win? It, it, he'll look more competent unless, you know, he just can't do it anymore uh, because he is president. He'll be on a stage and look presidential and actually have a conversation. The chance that you're going to have policy debates if we have Biden-Trump discussions, like, well, I have no, those, the, them talking to each other is nuts. I mean, he was trying to give him COVID last time. Right. And, and I so, know it's just but, like let's well, try to kill him while he was on the stage. Yeah, but the, <laughs> like if you think of the uh, uh, the places where uh, Biden moved towards the left in the last election, it was because uh, Bernie Sanders pushed him. Um, right. The the you would not have got the initial push on the Green New Deal or student loans and these kind of things. He had like no real policy. He never said prior to getting pushed that he actually supported. Uh, single payer health care in any way, right? Like, or Medicare for all and that kind of thing. Like, the, 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 it, and so I, th- part of the least the way I was like, well, um, he, when he switched his chief of staff, he's gotten less and less edgy. Uh, and, and then you're avoiding debates and stuff, which is where you actually, where he finds out where the, the where the party actually is. And I don't, I don't think when you look at polling and when you look at the growing frustration uh, from where people uh, that, that supporting him previously, like what good are what goods being done by not actually campaigning and then actually talking about policies? You're it just seems like uh, the the mechanism is like uh, I'll show up for planned things to say stuff. Uh, my team would keep doing work and then y'all just remember Trump's the other option. And so it makes it harder to feel like you have the ability to push things, uh, unlike last time, where by the time Sanders backs out, like there's been real concessions and there were action plans on stuff that was getting pushed in Congress. Um, and I think that the, uh, yeah, what you know, I bet they're making most decisions on what they think will actually end up winning the election because they're so scared if Trump wins. Uh, but, you know, I... Well, what I would like to do, if we could, is switch back to Trump, because Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's going on is there's still a lot of flow and there's still a lot of time uh, that's happening in terms of the Democratic primary. I mean, we, we actually do not know what final choices they're going to make about conversations or any kind of town hall type things, et cetera. Well, Diane, we just want to let let Biden know he's more than welcome to come on ruining dinner. <laughs> well, I would actually love to have him. I think he would be kind of an interesting guy to talk to. People say he's very sharp in person. And, um, you know, but anyway, that's that to me, that's beside the point. I really want to get back to it at this moment. It's not beside the point for our longer arc of religion and politics conversations. But at this moment, I think one of the things that's really painful, uh, I mean, that's really important is, I mean, we are looking at this indictment and you said a while ago, you know, like it's like well, giving up on democracy. I want to tie that back um, to religion. And I, this is something I remember happening in a youth group in high school and certainly conversations in the evangelical college when I was growing up. And so this is in the late 70s. And through the 1980s. So I'm really interested if you heard stuff like this in your sort of circles growing up, which is after mine. And that is, I can remember youth group leaders and college professors saying that democracy wasn't biblical. And so instead, they would point out, I remember literally uh, an entire series sermon at the Bible church I went to in high school about how democracy never shows up in the Bible and that the most 
um, I guess, sacred, holy, theologically approved version of government, whatever it was, were kings. Which is also a debated, right? Like, <laughs> well, that's I mean, like if you've read the Samuel. Hebrew Bible, yeah, <laughs> one version of the history, God's like, kings are great. Y'all should get a quality one. And the other one, God's like, why do you want a king? This is a horrible idea. <laughs> And so, so, I mean, I don't know if other people heard stuff like that. You know, it's like uh, in evangelical churches, there are always there, there was both the flag waving because you didn't want to be commie, you know, and so you would wave the American flag and and sing all the hymn, the patriotic songs and stuff. But on the other hand, I distinctly remember this other line of talk where democracy could be a problem. Uh, you couldn't was it really right to give everybody the vote? And the big example that people used of democracy fouling things up was um, abortion. And so see, see, look, you can't have a democracy because what if the majority of people want, you know, to kill babies? And so wouldn't it be better to have a wise king? Like I said, you, and you said too, so, you know, take a look at second Samuel, but um <coughs> But that was, I, I, I keep thinking about that and wondering how it sort of plays into that longer arc of the development of white Christian nationalism mm -hmm. and their sort of whole longing for authoritarian leaders, which is, you know, the evangelicals, this won't matter. Woohoo, just let's burn it, you know, now because they won't even read it. Um, so, so anyway, is that something that you heard along the way? It's sort of a... I disgruntled cruelty about I don't know I mean I I guess growing up in Baptist circles like uh, your ecclesiology is democratic um, and but my family were a lot of clergy and military so love for democracy was huge and the kind of and freedom of conscience and uh, the freedom to vote Growing up, there were plenty of times I knew my parents canceled each other's votes out. Um, uh, they don't anymore, but that's because <laughs> the options changed. Uh, so, but no, I do think, I I do think, and, and this is mostly from our mutual friend Tim Whitaker, like sending me random stuff from current right wing types. Oh, good! I love like, Tim's uh, stuff like that. Like I'm like you'll he'll be like check this out, you know, and then I'm like this is crazy. And he's like, Oh no, no. Uh, they have 200 million subscribers on their YouTube. I'm like, Oh no. And underneath it is this sense that, um, you, that if you don't, if you don't think the, the popular, if you think the populace is determined by something that's demonic, then letting democracy thrive is like letting Satan run wild. That's right. And that is so different than when you think of why democracy kind of emerged in America. It's like, oh, we actually have people from different countries. We have states that are centered in different, you know, essentially Protestant denominations at that point. Um, we are trying to figure out how to live uh, and uh, live together and all these kinds of things. And and uh, democracy emerges as the way uh, Western monotheistic groups recognize the dignity of the individual indifference without having 30 years war <laughs> right like right. we get the that this notion of a subject that has the ability to think reflect and then engage in in the populace and over and 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 so like the origin story of america i think at least for me growing up democracy was the means by which uh truth if it, you know, truth gets contested in a public that has already decided to be peaceable uh, and be it right. Like take Roger Williams debating with Quakers or, um, or, or like debating over foreign policy or these kinds of things. Uh, but if you can inscribe everyone that disagrees with you into a narrative where their agency is the agency of Satan, right. Then it's nuts. Like I, one of the, one of the, people what one of these videos you know was going on and on like john MacArthur uh going you know uh california was famous mm -hmm. for keeping his church open and lockdown uh popular calvinist preacher 
uh, like far right wing style. Um, he was going on and on about drag queens. And then like, and then somehow it gets connected to, we have to take over America and things because we're to protect kids. Same guy had protected multiple staff members who sexually assaulted kids. Right. You know, it's like there are more kids assaulted at your church by your staff you protected than have ever been assaulted at drag queen story hours. And like the framework just doesn't there. There's no connection because if the others agency in a democracy is the agency of Satan, then, you know, all sorts of things follow. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, hearing that you, like you had that and then hearing it again there, but I don't remember, I've never thought, I've never thought that, or like was in a, in a community where the problem was democracy. It was always, we haven't expanded the democracy yet, or we haven't lessened the impact, the, the voices of the powerful through like money and these kinds of things, or we've created laws that limit the impact of the working class. And yeah. Well, you know, I think it's interesting that you would bring up the idea, you know, that these democratic ideals were all about the founding of America. And you bring up Roger Williams and the Quakers and some other really important sources for that. But um, the I, I was thinking of a little bit later, and that is during the American Revolution, this, there are really serious American historians of the last generation who tie together the first great awakening uh, with the American Revolution. And there's a, apparently a really famous uh, book uh, called, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it because it's just like, that's COVID brain. But I believe it was by Gordon Wood, who is still mm -hmm. active as a historian, very senior historian now. And he, he made the point that without the First Great Awakening, there would have been no American Revolution. And um, that means that the I one thing never point that out to an evangelical <laughs> I've done that and they get very upset by that uh, because it means that something about evangelical religion has is is deeply tied to political democracy and so the their whole it should be that they're mm -hmm. a worldview uh, that is more committed to say democracy than like the Episcopal church, which was an offshoot of the church of England, which there are people in the Episcopal church today who still want to pray for the King, you know? And so, so there's this weird sort of historical turn that happens somewhere along the line where the evangelicals who are initially the, willing to have a revolution for democracy are now the very people who are looking at democracy saying, Oh, well, you know, people are bad. And I think it has something to do with our anthropology, mm -hmm. you know, because evangelicals always stood in this weird place where at least initially they, they, they've never sure whether they're Calvinists or they're not. Um, and so if you're, if you think you are saved by being born again, you've already introduced certain ideas about how you as an individual has some control over your own salvation by this ritual, by, uh, you know, believing belief as a work, you know, what, whatever it is. And so that empowers you as an individual. Mm -hmm. that, no wonder they like democracy. Cause if you can choose to be, go to heaven, if you can choose to be born again, you can certainly choose who your governor should be. And so, so it kind of fit together. But then there's this constant fighting within evangelicalism about Calvinism. And it seems pretty obvious that the authoritarian views of evangel uh, the authoritarian politics we have right now of evangelicalism, you know, emerged out of Calvinist political theory, Rush Dooney, Christian Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And the idea that people are innately bad. So you can't have a good democracy. You can't trust people to use their vote to forward the kingdom of God. And so therefore, there's only two ways that you can make sure that the, the, the kingdom of God comes forth. One is you have to have the majority of the people in the democracy be converted. They all have to agree 
uh, with you about your religious views. So you have to silence all your opponents. You can't have Muslims and Buddhists and all those other people. You have to, or you can, but they can be, they have to be marginalized politically. Uh, so you can do that, um, or you have a different kind of political system, uh, a top-down one, uh, one that doesn't involve democracy, one that continually limits uh, democracy. And people are always making fun of me on social media because many of us know that there has been a long, uh, quiet argument uh, in the same form of authoritarian evangelicalism that has, that you were part of, you, you that have affected your life in the Southern Baptist convention, mm -hmm. growing up Baptist, all those wonderful things that you learned as a, as a kid, those all got stripped away from you by these authoritarian Calvinist Baptists. And so I mean, now they don't even count Russell Moore. No, I mean, he's too liberal, uh, which is just like unfreaking believable. Uh, <laughs> Russell Moore, who will never talk to me because I apparently am like the war of Babylon. Um, so, so, you know, so you have this whole sort of really low anthropology Calvinist takeover of the evangelical tradition that makes them sort of say the only option then is for the is for redeemed men to run the government. And, um, anyone who God has appointed to be in that position of authority. And so the long argument I was going to say that they're involved in is there's a whole bunch of them who think that women shouldn't have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. and, and I can, I can guarantee you we will see coming down the pike, um, both getting rid of birth control and there will be a significant minority but increase one that will increasingly pressure the overton window about how women shouldn't have the right to vote in america and um every time i say that on twitter people say i'm an alarmist you know what i've been called an alarmist so many times that i'm just i can't even hear i don't even hear it anymore and and so so this thing here this is wrapped up with all of that with a denial of democracy on the part of all of those evangelicals who decided they would rather worship Donald Trump as a demi-messiah and flush democracy down the toilet because they want, a, they want a strong, godly ruler whom they believe that God has appointed Ooh. over America to control women and black people. And you just yawned in the middle of my tirade. Ooh, no, just thinking about <laughs> that guy. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> like that's who you want? I'm like, oh. Yeah, really, honestly. So anyway, mm. I'm doing pretty good. I haven't talked for a whole week. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I know we're saving it up. <laughs> we're not we're trying not to go long since uh we don't need your energy disappearing. Yeah. Um can I ask you a few of the fun questions people sent? Mm. You know, they could be like dessert questions, you know. Sure. All right. What's your favorite movie you've seen this summer? Oh, I haven't seen any movies this summer. I thought you you texted me and said you were sitting on Netflix the last the last uh, few. Oh, I was mostly watching, you know, true crime and my favorite one was <laughs> during during the COVID flood this last week. I rewatched all these seasons of Sex in the City, and I also watched The Crown, kind of going back and forth between the two of them. And I had a dream that Carrie Bradshaw was the queen of England. <laughs> <laughs> that would really, uh, that would be something. So anyway, <laughs> that hilarious. Did you put it in the, into one of the AI bots to get uh, the pilot episode? <laughs> for... <laughs> <laughs> the, um, it, Carlton mentioned Oppenheimer in the, in the comments. I went to, and I so would love to have not missed Barbenheimer by being in bed. I, I went I went to see Oppenheimer with uh, Elgin and one of his buddies. Um, and uh, it's a it, it's a wonderful film. Um, and it it is I well, at least I hope it gets seen as a sobering reminder of the consequences uh, for yeah. uh, who is in the decision making seat and the power of uh the, the power the military industrial complex has over <coughs> you know decision making process it is like you need someone with with character and a backbone 
to be pulling certain, uh, making certain decisions. And uh, probably, hypothetically, not someone who takes plans for invasions to move around in, in bathrooms at a golf club. That's <laughs> that. I don't know. That's one place to begin. Um, but the, the, it, it was just funny to see how, um, at that point in history, and this, you know, it started a little bit before that during the first world war where scientists have always, uh, since then identified with the scientific community where they push and ask questions across nation state boundaries. Um, you can see this in, right. uh, say like, you know, or, uh, Einstein's initial theories uh, get proven right by um, by the Royal Society. Uh, and they're at that point in a war with each other. Um, and then you get you see how it's playing out here around Jewish scientists and uh, in World War Two. And they're it's like, well, if someone's going to get the bomb now, that we know it's possible. We don't need the Nazis to get it kind of thing to then. Are we really going to use it for these purposes and the kind of logic that gets there? Um, but the, the thing I thought. Um, and if you get a chance to see it, uh, I, I wish I wish Christians functioned that way. That followers of Christ in different countries actually thought that they had a shared commitment to some kind of truth. That you thought, how can we cooperate in these different countries, the different fields we're in, and places we're in, um, and uh, that, like, like that we you know move against it, yeah. and. It really is kind of time, way past time. Just think about humanity as our tribe to go back to that earlier thing. You know, it's like our tribe is not just within these crazy borders. Yeah. And, um, you know, this would be my nice Hauerwas statement for the year. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think he's right. Like if Christians just decided not to kill Christians, there would be a whole lot less war. Uh, oh my gosh, yes. I mean, it would be nice if we, you know, just didn't even kill our enemies given Jesus' thoughts about it. But uh, but we can start with the people that have the same Eucharist. <laughs> See how it goes. Same baptism. Yes. So, okay. The, but it is something that um, this is, this was the guy who was in charge of all of that for four years. It's amazing we didn't blow up to smithereens. Yeah. No, uh, it makes I, me believe in the Holy Spirit, actually. In I bet in the next 20 years, the number of things that come out that got oh. uh it's just wild. Right. Do you think so? Do you uh we had a we asked for a puppy update, most exciting puppy update. <laughs> well, Demon Puppy is starting to turn into a really pretty good dog. Ah. And, and so that's really we're very happy about that because the reason you didn't get that many patty updates is that we did not know what to do with him. He, he is like the busiest, most active puppy. And when but he, he was eating everything, my foot, my clothes. I mean, he, it was, he, I, I, I said to him innumerable, I said to Richard innumerable times, are we sure we can do this? But you know, Richard's been great actually with patty. He's taken him, to all these different training classes and really worked with him hard. And he's, he's turning into a really neat little dog. And so we're very, we're happy with the little, the little booger. <laughs> so, no need for an exorcism at the bass house. So with the dog. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I mean, it does make for rather, rather cute pictures. Yeah. Um, he's a good, he's a, he's a good little guy. He's hard to take pictures of. He's so busy. I've never seen a puppy that's this busy. So, well, you know, that eventually they slow down. That's what now ours that we used to be wild is just like looks around for what human is not moving and will let me on their lap. Oh, you know? but that's she's it. old. Well, so it, what, is there anything on the horizon you want to direct people towards? Oh gosh. Um, I think one of the interesting things to sort of watch with all of this is uh, the fact that we now have all these words uh, from Mike Pence that are clearly part of this indictment. There are going to be some evangelical leaders who, who might feel kind of torn because they've known Mike Pence for a really, really, really long time. 
And part of the reason that they supported Trump initially was because of Mike Pence's imprimatur, you know, on him. Um, and now that Pence is backing away, um, it'll be interesting to see how much more public Pence becomes in his backing away. That will force some number of at least the more thoughtful evangelical types who are who have still been in Trump's camp to have to choose, really. I mean, that it's going to come down between a war between Pence and Trump. And religiously, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch because it's going to be a kind of an argument between, like I said, sort of it might be between the more Robert Jeffress sort of Calvinist Baptist types and some of mm -hmm. the um, re Christian reconstructionists. Cause that's where Mike Pence has always been sort of in that Christian reconstructionist, the family camp, you know, stuff, the Jeff Charlotte book, the family. And so, so that's Pence's long time bailiwick. And then Trump over here with all the, the charismatics and the Luke wall now, and the, you know, all the people who are the apocalyptic sort of, Pentecostal preachers. So we could see a real rift um, around the evangelical community uh, about that. And I think that that's worth paying attention to. I don't know how it'll show up in polls, at least for a while, mm -hmm. but I think it will show up in their magazines and in their websites. And it might show up in some of their churches. And mm -hmm. so, so that's going to be one of those little on the ground things to uh, listen for. Yeah. Yeah. It, do you um uh we should talk about this uh next time because I know Richard's thinking don't let her go too long and get Aww. too tired. But uh <laughs> be so I, I have had a, a number and I saw you mention this somewhere, uh, but I've also had a number of mainline Protestant ministers say, um, oh, we're getting like random groups of evangelicals showing up at our liberal mainline church. Mm -hmm. And what do we do with them? And, you know, other than like not having bad music, um, like going like, how do you talk to them? What are they, what it, it seems, I don't understand like where they came from, you know, if, if that was your world. Uh, but I think that's something uh, we should talk about in, uh, in the future that I, I, we actually going to have this year at beer camp. Um, we're going to have certain breakouts that are like in rooms that are unrecorded uh, for like smaller conversations. And one is for clergy who are having ex evangelicals show up. Um, I'm so bummed. I can't be there. We're doing one with uh, where like professional brewers teach you how to do beer tasting and, you know, say things that sound like, you know what you're doing. Um, and one for uh, like parents and grandparents on like passing on the faith without all the baggage and these kind of things. But when I, it was funny asking like, Oh, well, what if we were going to have, you know, like off the record sessions, what kind of things and multiple clergy were like, I was one of the reasons I came is because there are these people listening to all these podcasts that started going to our church. And I don't know, I don't really know how to deal with them, but they, they were like, Oh, you know who John Dominique Crossan is too. <laughs> <laughs> we heard him on the podcast. <laughs> Well, you know, this is actually, I mean, you know, I've talked to you about this. All those different places I've been in Red America and those little blue churches, every single time I've gotten in a car in an airport, a pastor, and I've asked the pastor who picked me up, what's going on in your church? And every single one of them, without knowing the others, I have said uh, within the first 10 minutes of the conversation that they are having ex-evangelicals show up in their congregations and they're usually younger families and um so i've talked to a lot of these pastors who have been sort of coping with this really interesting phenomenon and have i have oodles oodles of good ideas i wrote a, a piece about it in the in the cottage and i could sort of resend the link if people are interested but um i just had another phone call this morning same thing an Episcopal church in a red state. And all of a sudden, just all these ex-evangelicals are walked in the door. And most of, it seems like people are finding these churches through podcasts, you know, ours or uh, Substack newsletters and mm -hmm. Twitter accounts and all these sorts of things. And 
a lot of people apparently, and this is what these pastors have been telling me, watch their churches during the pandemic online Mm -hmm. because it was a soft way in the door. Um, And they, they, they saw things they liked. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that that's really exciting. And I'm constantly telling my mainline pastor friends, this does not mean that the mainline is saved, (laughs) that there's going to be thousands of people, you know, coming in your door. But it's more like this sort of steady, interesting stream that does seem to be flowing by the doors of um, or flowing in the doors of some mainline churches. And it requires some very beautiful and very tender and interesting pastoral care. My my one suggestion at the end of this podcast is do not see a young family who's ex-evangelicals and ask them to either lead the music team or teach Sunday school. Because what's <laughs> trip, you know, they have, to be there. they have to be there before you ask them to volunteer. That's right. Do not ask them to volunteer. Uh, what you need to do is you need to ask them who they are and why they've come and you're glad and tell them you're glad they're there and offer them hospitality and ability to listen to their questions. And the last church I was in where there had been a sort of an inflow of several of these young couples, very small church. Um, I talked to the, the couples, um, after I preached and they all said that the biggest gift they were given by the congregation was the ability to ask lots of questions and not be judged. Mm -hmm. And they're asking questions about theology, asking questions about polity. Why do you do that? And so what it means is the congregations who are receiving these new, uh, guests and hopefully new new parts of their family um, have to know what they believe, why they believe it, what they do, why they do it. Cause you're going to have to answer a lot of questions. You can't just assume, you can't say, Oh, well, that's the way we've always done it or any of that. You have to explain it to people and, and explain it in ways that are spiritually compelling and meaningful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I mean, it's good news. The, it is good uh, news. that there that people are actually finding their way to communities that uh, can resonate more deeply with their values and give permission to ask questions. Um, and uh, now we just have to figure out how to talk uh, talk all of us clergy into not answering them all immediately. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes people ask a question because they would like for it to be heard, not solved. Oh gosh, yes. Well, you know, that, I mean, tomorrow's Alicia and I's 21st anniversary. So the, oh, congratulations. That, that means our third decade of marriage. I'll figure that out. <laughs> it's gotten to the point recently where I'm just like, so are you sharing this event? Are you asking this as a question or are you, uh, are you wanting my response? And I'm just talking trip. You don't have to. Ah, uh, that's great. Or well, hold I on. Think, or my maybe... favorite is hold on, professor. Oh, (laughs) I actually learned that around the dining room table with Emma when she was little. There would be times where she would just like in utter frustration, like she's eight years old, throwing up her hand. Mommy, it's not a classroom. (laughs) It's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I just have to explain everything. (laughs) You're like, but for some of us, it's our happy space. That's right. I love teaching. <laughs> You're like, my favorite conversations are the kinds that fit in a three-hour seminar. Are you ready? Like, <laughs> L just got to this new thing where he's like, um, I'm a, I, I have a question. and We can talk about it later after you think about what you really want to say. I'm like, well, that's fine. He goes, no, no, no. Just like think of like three minutes. <laughs> I love that. Now he's like, I want to read your first book and I'll let you know if I have questions. And now like anytime I see him reading the homebrewed Christianity guide to Jesus, I'm like, how's it going? How's it going? You got, what do you think? You want to talk about it? <laughs> it's fine, dad. It's fine. <laughs> fine. Fine. <laughs> That's the difference between, I mean, I don't mean to stereotype, but so many times that's the answer boys give. You know, <laughs> whereas Emma would come back with me and she'd have some really long charted out philosophical thing. It's like, whoa. <laughs> Look, you know, 
I, <coughs> whatever. I I was just glad he. I'm just glad he he had any interest whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. it's really great. That's that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I so, think that can we just leave people? I, I have just like a sort of closing, sort of hope. Yeah. Um. You know. However, I do encourage people to read this. Um. It's not hard to read, and it's not. I I hate legal writing, and this is very narrative. It's very objective, but it's also very narrative. I mean, it's st really straightforward. It says, you know, the Pennsylvania governor signed a certificate of ascertainment and certified the federal government to the federal government that Biden's electors were legitimate for the state. So, I mean, that's an easy sentence to understand. The secretary of Pennsylvania approved, you know, so what's the issue? So, so it's, it's really clear sentences all the way through. Um, make sure you read it. If I would actually encourage people, if you know uh, that there is a group of folks who would be willing to give stuff like this a fair shot, it wouldn't be a bad thing to read in a reading group and say, look, this big historical thing is happening. Instead of just paying attention to what's on the news, we want to go ahead and read the document that the Department of Justice has sent out and try to evaluate it for ourselves. And so, so that's, you know, fair going. Um, I would encourage you to read it. I would encourage you to try to get a couple other people to read it who might want to read it with you. And then the other piece is these are really complicated times emotionally. And I think that whatever you're feeling regarding this, whether you're feeling hopeful, you're feeling like, yeah, we finally got him, you know, sort of <laughs> happy revenge, uh, eating a bag of Cheetos like Richard and I were, um, no matter what your sort of emotional response, feeling a little despairing, is it going to get off again, like the trout that keeps getting away? Um, it, just go ahead and that's fine. Wherever you are in this crazy journey of democracy and caring about um, authoritarianism around the world, because it's not just about us in the United States, this is about all of us all around the world and how we deal with this moment of despair and anger at the governments we've had for good reasons and, and not so good reasons. Um, we're, we're just in it together, you know, and, and I'm really glad trip that we always get to talk about this and, and can talk with this community about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's always fun. And uh, I dropped in, a link to the audio version of someone, if you prefer listening, it's a podcast episode. That's just someone reading the whole indictment. Is it really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a great thing to do. Yeah. I, I've, I found it cause I knew you would have read it and uh, you know, it made, it made dishes feel really different. You know, it's just, it was not catching up on the Dodgers and Lakers podcast, which tend to be a little more enjoyable. This is, <laughs> But it's so but, fantastic in terms of uh, disability needs, too. I mean, that is just the best. So. Yeah. Sweet. Well, I will look forward to doing this again soon. And thank you all that are members of the Cottage and the Homebrewed community uh, for, um, you know, supporting us and making yes. things we do possible. It's great. It is uh, quite a joy to get to do these. And, um, you know, just think, if y'all didn't exist, I'd have to come up with a better reason talk to diana regularly <laughs> otherwise she must might start getting the you know a bunch of text threads and trip we have to tell people we are not mad at each other because everybody's seeing the theology beer camp announcement and i'm not on it and everyone thinks oh if you and trip broken no, it, up you diana know? <laughs> was a secret event that the dates weren't on the internet when we were when we were picking dates it was a, a failure to use uh calendars and communication and planning in advance but um plus our our host this year has a school and that's the week they're off so we get the whole building if we do uh. it on fall break uh which is gonna be it's gonna be quite a bit of fun uh if y'all are considering coming you should get your tickets we've sold 75 percent more tickets than we've sold at this point last time so i'm pretty sure it will sell out and uh we just announced we're having music too uh Dan from Jars of Clay and Derek Webb from Cademan's Call are going to do music and things. And 
Oh, Reggie, who y'all have all met, who had Diana um, for church history, will be speaking. And Dom, who's hung out, Dom Crossan's hung out with us, will be there along with like tons of other, you know, nerdy peoples. I encourage people to get their COVID updated booster shots before going. <laughs> you don't want to get it naturally. Uh, no, you really don't. I know they say it's mild. That's what everybody says, but it wasn't mild for me. It's relative. Mild's relative. Mild is relative. Yeah. <coughs> All righty. Mm. Heal up and we'll uh, get to do this soon. Thank you all for hanging.